All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Mindful Hunter podcast. I'm your host, as always, Jay Nickel. And two interesting pieces of information today. We've got a new guest on the show, Bob Stetcher, and we're at Whitetail Camp. How's it going, Bob? It's going well, buddy. It's going well. So we are, I might as well share exactly where we are because there's not that many places to go late season whitetail hunting in British Columbia anyways. No. But we are, we're at Kettle River Guides in Region 8. And they kind of have like a short late season whitetail bow hunt here. And it's kind of interesting because this kind of wasn't original. You weren't originally going to be here when I was here, but then you had some other kind of complications and scheduling overlaps and had to push your hunt. So now we're here at the same time. Yeah, there was some flooding. Yeah. BC got a little wet, unfortunately. Yeah, 100%, man. And that delayed everything for us. So got pushed back, got pushed back. And somehow we uh, had an essential reason to get here. And uh, so we're having a good time. Yeah. Um, shit, now I forgot what I was what I was going to say. Oh, we are kind of like two ships passing in the night though, because I got my first day was your last day. Yeah. Yeah. I have to head back home tomorrow morning. Uh, I got to work finally I work in the afternoon. I got a couple ice times. And so I got to head back, but uh, hopefully you have a good hunt. Yeah. And have some luck for sure. And I hope so, man. I'm the last hunter here now. So I kind of like that because at least I don't have any competition. I can take all the good stands. Yeah. You're the only hunter too for them. You're closing out the season after you're- I'm the last guy. You're the last guy. Yeah. yeah. They're closing up. Tammy even told me because I got in a little bit late, if I want to stick around for Wednesday morning, I can. Oh, nice. Good. I, I'm not sure my wife would be- a, My original plan was to go home Tuesday night. Yeah. Just come in from the woods and and, and head it so out. I could yeah. take my kid to school in the morning. So Tough though. You got to check the roads- Especially yeah. at, at that nighttime and these roads right now and then the highway. That number three is a bitch, man. Like that's just a shit road. Bumper to bumper. Yeah. <laughs> too. And just so much snow and yeah. Anyways, that's a whole other podcast <laughs> road condition in British Columbia right now. Um, so we're going to, we'll get back to what we're doing and how the hunting is, has been in here, but let's kind of go, go back to the beginning with, with you. Are you originally a BC boy? Yeah, uh, my family was uh, born and raised in Richmond. Okay. Yeah, at Stetcher's. And um, so I just grew up in Richmond, playing some hockey. And then uh, when I was about 13, my uncle would take me out here and there, mainly like Thanksgiving weekend. Yep. And that consisted of <laughs> driving around in a red and white A-team, va A-team van, <laughs> looking for mule deer in Tulamine, BC. Okay. So that was my first exposures to hunting. And then, and, and... So walk us through it from there. So when does it go, when does it kind of go up a notch? Does it go away for high school and then kind of come back when you, when you get an adult or like, what's the path look like? Five years ago when I turned 40. Okay. I, something clicked and I guess a lot of, about five years ago, a lot of the YouTube hunting was really starting to boom. Yep. And, uh, you know, there was just so much more on social media. And so I just saw it and I just ran with it and I've just, buried myself in it for the last five years trying to learn as much as i can every single season yeah so. and we were talking earlier how many hunts did you get out on this year uh this is my eighth hunt since september um i have a very understanding wife <laughs> um but she knows that it, i gotta get out i gotta get out there and get in the bush it's where i feel at peace yeah i feel calm and it's the only objective is just being in the bush and being in the woods, nothing else matters in the world at that time. I yep. just have to deal and be present. And I, I just love that. I just a hundred percent, man. That's what it's all about. Okay. So five years ago you get into it. So what's the first thing that, that happens? Like what was the first hunt? Was it like a backcountry thing or what was the goal? Uh, no, for the first three years, I basically road hunted with my uncles road hunted with a with a hunting partner i did it was it was okay but boring and but it was just the, the way a lot of people get into hunting yeah and and so i just i i was just talking to people and just listening and and looking for advice and but the, but a lot of it was just road hunting what i would do is i would drive in find somewhere and then just go for a walk but uh, but at that point, I never 
ventured very far at all. And what were success rates like? Like, what are we killing shit, or are we still just like a lot of walking, a lot of gun hiking? Uh, a lot of gun, a lot of taking my gun for a for a walk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I got I got one buck like on year two. It was just it was a it was a two point and a spike. Okay, and that was my first buck. Yep, I actually literally shot it at the rifle range, just off the rifle range in Tulavine. Okay, <laughs> which was crazy. <laughs> like you right, and um, and then I got a then I got um a, a three by three. Uh, a decent three by three, which I liked, um, and I got that in um, Colmont. Uh, so people that know Princeton, Colmont, Tulamine area, they'll they'll understand all those. And for the last year, I did not shoot anything. Okay, I saw probably twenty, thirty bucks, but most of them were two points and three points in that, and I wanted to shoot something bigger. Yeah, something changed where I just wanted bigger animals. So. You voiced an opinion earlier when we were on the fire that I kind of want to get into, and it was something along the lines of, you feel comfortable, you're going to get your big buck and you're going to get your big bull, but you're not necessarily in a rush for that to happen, or maybe more specifically, if you go out on a hunt and that doesn't happen, you're kind of okay with that. 100%. Yeah, it's. I feel that it's inevitable that it's going to happen as long as I work hard. And I just keep putting days in and keep learning how to get better and, you know, searching out people that are knowledgeable, talking to those people that eventually, you know, I'm going to get my six point bull. I'm going to get my goat, right? If I do go after sheep one day, you know, hopefully that will be able to happen too. You know, I, 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 was, I knew I had a goal. I wanted to get a white tail or an elk. And, you know, and I, I got my white tail this year. I'm pretty pumped about that. Yeah. You've we're going to get it. into that. That's yeah, a pretty good story. Cool. And is that because you feel like, like the three by three was like a nice, decent mule deer. So you kind of feel like you've checked that one off the list for now. That's why the white tail was the white tail and the elk was kind of the next priority. Uh, yes, a little bit, but I wanted more mature animals. I started yeah. listening to a lot of podcasts and, you know, I wanted the trophy mature animal that is because that's what we should be harvesting. Yeah. Right. We shouldn't be harvesting the younger ones, but I mean, to each their own it's, if it's legal, right. I, I'm not going to say a word about whatever some, like if that's your first buck or whatever. Right. But I definitely set a goal that I wanted more mature animals. And I do think also there's like a, it, it, it's what is this hunt for you? Yeah. Like not every hunt I do is the same. Like I'm going to be honest, we'll get into it later, but we're out here, here bow hunting whitetail. And, uh, I'm not super picky on this hunt. Like there's lots of animals. There's no real big, big genetics in this area. I'm kind of looking to fill the freezer. I'm here to have a good time. And, and if I'm lucky, stick a couple arrows in some deer. But then there are those other hunts where the, the, the point is to challenge yourself and rise to the occasion and see what you can do against, you know, a solid example of that species. So yeah, I commend you for that, man. It's funny. And have you seen that article by Matt Ranella that's floating around? Yes, yes. I, I actually made a comment on it on the Facebook hunting group and I got like 15, 20 likes on it. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, it's kind of funny because we wouldn't be sitting here without social media. No. I think he makes some really, I think there are some good points in there. I think, I think he, we've gone too far in a couple of directions, but I also, and, and that's the point I wanted to say is this whole like, needing to go out there and like kill something for the gram is in direct like his philosophy that that's the the thesis or the the philosophy that social media promotes is kind of just been disproved right like right here mm -hmm. like you just said it was YouTube and social media that kind of got you fired up again in your when you turned 40 we met through Instagram, so we yep. wouldn't be sitting here having this conversation. And yet you're a guy who's not a super advanced hunter who's just said, it's more important to me to kill the right animal in the right way than just to shoot something to have a grip and grin. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm I'm not a killer. And there are those guys out there and, and that's fine. That's their own thing. Um I'm I'm the experience. And the adventure, I think the adventure a lot is a hu weighs huge on me. Uh, and then pushing myself to do something that I thought that I never was able to do before. Right, 
right? And then proving myself that I can do it and then proving it to my son and allowing my son to be able to, to understand that he can do that too. Yeah. No, I think that's really important. So let's get into that a little bit. So what did, what did this year look like? Maybe let's rhyme off the eight hunts and then we can kind of start back at the beginning. Okay, absolutely. Yeah, let's go over the. I, had, I was thinking about it last night when I was sitting in the stand and I was like, you know, how many hunts have I been on? And I, and I counted them all. It was eight. So I started the year in Chetwin. Okay. Uh, well, actually, Hudson Hope. And the group that I was with, they didn't like the hunting there. We were actually at Butler Ridge. Okay. And, and it could have been a good area. It's just you had to work for it. Right. And they didn't like that. And so we went down to Chetwin to our little honey hole. And we got into elk there. We got into whitetail there. Uh, got into seven foot black bears there. Wow. Yeah, yeah. We 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 pulled one seven foot black bear. One of the guys into our camp, and then um, uh, I had I had a chance at one. Unfortunately, we, we didn't get it. But uh, there were some big big bears there for sure. Um, so we hunted there for ten days. I came home. Um, and what are we talking? Are we talking like a like wall tent setup, hotel hunting? What are we doing? Uh, so uh, we um we have a utility trailer. Okay, that's been converted. Yeah, and those are I'm seeing more dudes with those now. It's comfortable. Do you got like a wood stove and shit in there? Uh, no, we just had um electric heaters. Okay, sure. Right, so we were running a generator. Yep, and um it was fine. Uh, we were there from September 5th until and for 10 days. Okay, so to the 15th or 16th, I think is we came home on the Friday. And so it wasn't even that bad, right? It wasn't yeah. that cold. I mean, it was getting a little bit chilly, but it was fine. Yeah. Right. And so, um, yeah. So uh, after that, I came home for two weeks and I did a little bit because my hockey academy was starting. Okay. And so I had to start that. And then I booked it to Princeton. Okay. Go see my aunt and uncle. Yeah. My aunt and uncle lived there. And my uncle is one of the premier elk hunters in Princeton. He absolutely slays elk there. He's got his 19th elk this year. So uh, good, that job. Is, <laughs> good job, Uncle Ray. You know, it's funny. I go on these rants about how like challenging elk hunting is in BC. And then like I hear about dudes like your uncle and I'm like, apparently I'm just a shit elk hunter. No, <laughs> like, no. Yeah. He's one of the only guys that are slaying it there yearly. Yeah, that's impressive, man. Good for yeah. him. Yeah. So I, so I, I, there for a few days looking for elk, um, we don't get into we we see a five point we see some cows we we don't get into the into a six point so that wasn't happening. Come home for um, another week, and so I gotta go a little bit back on the Facebook hunting group. There was this property that this family was trying to sell, and it's in uh, it's south of the Churn Creek protected area, the grassland areas. You know that area? I don't. Okay, so it, it's um, it, it's up in uh, like three five hundred two five hundred three. Okay, management unit. So okay. it's up in the Caribou. Yep, up there more on more to the left, and it's all just grasslands. They had major fires there this year too. But okay, so this this family has an off grid property there, and the lady that was trying to sell it, the daughter in law, she posted a video on the Facebook hunting group of hundreds and hundreds of mule deer on their property. And then she sent her dogs to go run them off because they were eating all the hay that was for their horses. Right. And all you see is the whole mountainside just become alive with mule deer. It's just crazy. I was like, I want to find that place. <laughs> well, I found it. I, I, I went on Google Maps and, and Fat Maps and I just searched the area and I found it online. And so I was like, I'm going to go hike in there. And you could only hike in there. Okay. And so I hiked into the back country, and that was my first time ever doing anything like that. But when, here's the thing. When I get in there, I didn't update my Zolio. Okay. And I, that's the one thing that I have a little bit of beef about Zolio is that there are so many updates. And if it doesn't, it doesn't work if you don't do them? Exactly. See that's fucked up. My inReach, you it, it might update every now and then, but if you just don't update it, you just you can still go in and use it. Yeah, no, mine didn't work. Oh no. And so I'm in there, and I have a wife, right? And I, I sure. and I need to communicate that, and especially if I get hurt or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah. And so I'm like, oh, but I'm not just not gonna go. So I was in that predicament. Yeah. 
So I stayed in there two days, and then I came out, and oh my god! That, as soon as the the cell service clicked on, just I ding, ding 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 ding. I pulled over and called the wife. Oh, first she's like thankful that I'm alive. Yeah, yeah. Then I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she gave it to me. Especially too, because when I was it back there and I was side hilling, as I told you earlier, I stepped on a boulder, and the boulder gave way, and I started going down the down the rock slide. And the boulder went right through my trekking pole, just barely missed my leg and my arm. If if I I luck I still had this SOS on the Zaleo, so th okay. they could have come and got me. Yeah, but I could not have messaged anybody. <clears throat> I'd have been brutal. screwed. So it was it was. So I left there, and then I went to Kamloops. I have a buddy that lives in uh, Sun Peaks, and so I went mule deer hunt with him, and okay. then uh, and uh, whitetail hunt, and we didn't really get into much at all. Uh, came home from there and uh, was home for uh, two, two and a half weeks. And it's October. I really don't like hunting a ton in October. Okay. Right. Um, and so then I went back to Princeton, did another few days, which was okay, but nothing. I, I don't know. I just, Princeton's so overrun. There's so many hunters there. Gotcha. Right. And I've never spent much time there. I did yeah. a couple of days scouting maybe two, three years ago, but that's the only experience I've ever had there. Yeah. And then I uh, went to um, uh, Lumbee, did some whitetails after that. I went there for four days. Uh, I got into a few, but I never never got into any bucks. So, but I was still learning how to whitetail hunt there for sure. Right. But it, but it was experience. And, and that trip, I actually slept in my truck. Okay. I took the front seat out of my front of my F one fifty, and I put a I put a foldable mattress down there. It was amazing it was so good i brought the little buddy heater in there i didn't even turn the buddy heater on and i even got the like the monitor the co2 monitor that i didn't even turn it on i just ran the truck yeah I stayed in the back of the pub park you literally like you took the entire seat out took it out it's four screws it's four not four bolts and then untached the um the airbag it was so easy I just, it. I just youtubed it no shit yeah and i'm i'm not mechanical but i've been pushing myself to do more shit like that yeah yeah and learn I got it out, boom, because I because I I go hunting so much, right? That I didn't want to spend money on hotel. On that's why I have a cap on the back of my truck. Yeah, and that's why I it's like one of the only long box canyon all terrains in British Columbia. I had to drive that one. I got in Squamish. The last one I had to drive to Vernon to get because the box is six foot one, mm. um, and that the whole reason there's a canopy is so that I can sleep in the back of my truck. Yeah, oh, yeah. perfect. Yeah, the first time I tried it, I slept sideways in my truck. Okay. Like on the back seat. And, yeah. Well, I flip up the back seat. Oh, uh, okay. And I have a, like, it's a wide, like I have the yeah. wide cab, right? Yeah. So it was okay, but I'm too- That's a nice truck, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but uh, I had to bend my knees and I already got a bum knee as it is. So that started hurting. So I had to figure out and I took the yeah. seat out and it worked really well. I've done it for like three trips now and it was- What a good it idea, fine. man. Save on motel. I, yeah. I, I Especially when you're mind. just sleeping. Yeah. And if you don't have to, yeah, I'm a big fan of that, man. Plus you can sleep closer. I also like, I do a lot of long road trips to yeah. hunting. And I like the fact that, so one of my hacks is that I'll leave the night before I'm supposed to go on a trip. Because if I leave at seven or eight o'clock at night, my wife doesn't give a shit. Yeah. yeah. Like days over. Yeah. Leave then or leave 6 a.m. the next morning. It's mm -hmm. the same thing. And what I'll do is I'll leave at night and try and get six or seven hours down the highway. Yeah. Once it hits like 2 a.m., I'm kind of useless. But then I just pass out wherever I am, yeah. sleep in the back of the truck and wake up and do the rest of the drive the next morning. And normally I'm that way I can start hunting by, you know, eight, nine o'clock in the morning and I don't waste that whole half day or three quarters of that whole first day just kind of traveling. Yeah. But so again, being able to sleep anywhere and not have to make it to a hotel and some of these little towns, you, you it's tough too. It's not like they've got motel sixes with 24 hour front staff. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So uh, after that, we get in, I, I'm home. I, I work for two more weeks in the mid, uh, beginning part of November. Okay. And then um, the flood's happening. Flood's happening. And, and I'm starting to itch because I've been home two and a half weeks. I'm not normally home more than 10 days, and I'm, I want to get out and go. Yeah. And my son has an LEH goat hunt. And okay. we had already pl we had always planned to leave – on November, I think it was like a eighth or something like that, and, okay. and that just got wiped out, pushed back, and then delayed again. And finally, we said, okay, "Let's just go." We literally Saturday morning, Saturday night, or Saturday afternoon, we're like, "Let's just go." 
and we left at Sunday 4 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and we drove from Langley all the way straight through to Cranbrook. Okay. Stopping in Princeton uh, for breakfast. My aunt made us breakfast. Oh, that's badass. Yeah, I actually brought her gro up groceries too because the save on uh -huh. foods in Princeton <laughs> ran out of like milk, eggs, cheese, dairy, like all this stuff. Right? Brutal. Stuff, bread and that and pasta. And so I brought her all that up just to help out because Princeton was in bad shape. Right, right. The, the yeah, week I bet. before, right? So we got through and we drove all the way to Cranbrook. We spent How long does that take to get to Cranbrook? Uh, the, well, that trip took us... <laughs> I think it was nine hours. Okay. Nine hours. We took our time. Is the boy doing any of the driving yet? Uh, I don't, I let him drive around at home. He, had, yeah. he you know, he has his, uh, his N. Um, I didn't let him drive on the highways, especially. Like, Pretty sketchy the, time of year too. Yeah, right. Yeah, we already got sure. on that, but I didn't let him, and it was icy in that, yeah, right? Yeah. I, so I just, I just took our time and we just got there. We made lots of stops. Okay. And, and got there and so spent the night in the motel six and the next morning we get up and we drive into um drive from there uh into invermere okay uh his goat hunt was a uh, 426c and uh, which is just past uh panorama mountain resort okay and um we went in there we park we it we got in there too late we got okay. in there at like one o'clock in the afternoon we were only anticipating the hike to be two and a half, three hours, which would bring us there just right at dark. And we were going into a cabin that we had had, we had be given, we'd given some waypoints. Okay. And um, and then some waypoints of where the goats are. And what was the cabin supposed to be like a ministry cabin or just an old shack that somebody had put up? Like, Yeah, it was just an old abandoned guide cabin. Okay. And, but, but now after being up there and then talking to a few locals, I guess the local guide is still using that cabin. Oh, okay. Um, we never ever even made it to the cabin. Right, right. But but there is a, there's an old cabin back there that people use for goat hunting there. Okay. And um, so we get in, and and it was a, it was a hard pack. <laughs> it was a hard pack. And my son was a rock star. He, Sixteen years old. Uh, he carried a seventy pound pack. And uh, that's legit, man. Yeah, it, it was hard on him though. It was emotionally, yeah, and and physically, mentally, the hardest thing he's ever been put through. And uh, he didn't break. Uh, I was very proud of him. Very proud of him. And and so we got as far as we could, and then he he started tipping over a little bit here and there as he was getting tired, and it was getting dark fast. And so we we found a nice flat spot on top of the frozen creek. And camped the first <laughs> That's night. Too funny. <laughs> it was the flattest spot. It was actually fine. It was warm. The snow was insulating. Yep. And uh, the winds picked up a little bit that night, and that was a interesting first night. What tent are you guys in? So I, I looked at a lot of tents and went back and forth. I wanted to find a lighter tent, but yep. a, but a but a double wall tent that I can use all year round. And so I actually ended up purchasing a sling fin tent. I've never even heard of this. Yeah, it's a very small company. Well, after this though, but look them up. Okay. The tent is bomb proof. It, it is bomb proof. It's uh, sub three pounds. Holy shit. Yeah, it's a double wall tent. And big enough for you and your boy. My 16 year old son and I laid, uh, my head was on this side, his head was on that side. We had our two um, air pads together yep. and then it had the vestibule we had our bags in there we had cooking in there and our vestibule for the jet boils we were completely fine no shit yeah <clears throat> um has a lot of, uh so it's free it can be freestanding but it also has tie downs and then it has extra tie downs there and then you could put two trekking poles on each side as well okay so uh it's it can get pretty sturdy okay for sure and so it worked great i'll have to check that out yeah it, sweet it worked great and um, so we ended up going a little bit the next day. We get up in the morning. We go, we go another, we, which we thought was only going to be like 100, 150 yards. And it was like another kilometer, but it took us like three and a half hours. Like it was two feet plus of powder. It was challenging. Yeah. And there was, we did not find the trail <laughs> at all. <laughs> we just dropped down the, the cut here. You know, the trail is going to be along the creek bed. No, the trail went up the other mountain and then came down. And so we just ended up camping at um, uh, along this one trail that led up to the goats that just on the side of a ridge and it kind of plateaued out and it was under some cover and it was an awesome place to camp. It was cold though. It was got down to minus 10, minus 12. 
couple of times at night and we got through it and that's cold to sleep outside man yeah what kind of bags are you guys running so i last minute bought a bag okay and i bought um i bought a down bag yep i watched i watched countless videos on yep. synthetic versus down my biggest thing was weight yeah and that one out yeah so i bought um is it rab yep rab r-a-b yep i bought their um model 800 bag this okay. thing was amazing yeah they make nice shit it was so comfortable i, I could just get in there and the, it was it fit me like my size very well and okay. i was i use i sleep on a rotisserie or i'm just rolling <laughs> right like on my side on my belly on my back like it's just it's just a rotisserie like a freaking chicken in an oven there right yeah i was fine but I did wear because it did get cold. Yeah, I wore my big uh, North Face puffy. Okay, inside under, the bag. Inside the bag. Yeah, and that was that was helpful for sure. And then, um, uh, just like John says, I wore all my clothes every day. Yeah, I, I took my boots off, and I just climbed in my in my um, bag, and just cooked. I listened to your podcast just before we left, and that, and it was great that you had them on. It was perfect timing. Sick. Yeah, and yeah, he's a genius. And it it helped. It did take longer, a hundred percent. Yeah, and I did go through that little cold chills yeah. phase, right? But and just embrace the suck, and you just you know you got to do it. Yep, I'm gonna have to do it regardless. Now, if in the morning it'd be frozen. Yeah, right. The best thing about that hunt was I figured it out, and I didn't know, and I never found this info but how to keep your boots from freezing in the morning. And so what I what I did was I put my boots at my head and I put them I put my jacket underneath it and then I wrapped my jacket around my boots and then put my pillow on top of my boots. Okay. And then like the insulating heat from my head and whatnot and yeah. the top of my bed kept my boots warm. And so when I woke up in the mornings, they were never frozen. Somebody just told me, maybe it was you sent me a message. Somebody just told me to wrap my boots in a puffy. Yeah. Overnight. Yeah. And I'd never thought to do that and before. The, and put it under your head or yeah. by your head. Okay. And that way, because then it props you up a little bit, right? Yeah. And yeah, my boots did not freeze at all, which was because the first night they froze. Yeah. And it took half the day to dethaw them. Brutal. Br like brutal. It's brutal. the like, worst. It was, <laughs> yeah. It, like, but it ruins. It's like walking it. around with ice clothes. You can't even do anything though. No. Right? Yeah. You're miserable now, and it's already hard enough as it is. Yeah. Doing yeah. a goat hunt in the middle of winter and two foot two foot plus powder. Like it's just it's tough. And then if it gets wet, the snow. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. So where's that wet snow? <laughs> so bad. And this is your boy's first backcountry hunt. This is yes, his first back but it's my first backcountry hunt too. Right. Where unsupported, away from Jeez. the safety of the truck. Yeah. And we just jumped into it. We're like that's we're, impressive, man. We're doing a goat hunt and we're going to embrace it and we're just going to, we're going to learn. Yeah. And we're going to push through. And if we're tired, we're going to stop and we're going to have a snack and we're going to make some noodles and then we're just going to keep going. Uh, we, did, we, unfortunately, we did not see a goat. Yeah. Um, we saw lots of fresh tracks every morning. Uh, we'd glass these couple of areas that we knew goats were, were we were told where goats were and there were, there was tracks there. Absolutely. Um, we didn't find it as a failure. We found it, it was the hardest test of our lives mentally yeah. and physically, but coming out of it, we, we feel great about it now. We want to go do another one, but we'll go earlier and just take a few days to get up to the top and then just live there. Yeah. You know, beginning of September, what have you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You learn so much. I think too, it's hard to even like picture what the challenges are. Like you can hear people talk about it. But until you've lived through it, it's really hard to get a clear picture in your mind. And so when they happen to you for the first time, it throws you off your game. But now that you know what the worst of the worst is like in your head, you're going into that next one so much more prepared mentally. Oh, yeah. I, like, I've watched your video on the goat hunt like probably three or four times. I remember we talked about it yeah, yeah. before I was going to leave. And we're like, go watch the video again. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> so I watched the video again. And yeah, you, you you can see it, but you don't understand. No. Yeah. Right. And you, I know you even said that, but you got to, you know, like most of us, you got to experience it and learn. You do. 
you do. Yeah. I think videos, the cl- and that was one of the reasons I started making videos that I just found like trying to tell people or write about it. Like it just didn't do it justice. Yeah. And I think the video is the closest thing we got. I still think it fails, but it fails less than everything else. Yeah. Well, you saw a goat though. I did see I did yeah. see one goat. Yeah, you saw a goat. That's I saw more goats than that, but they were unachievable. Like you would have needed a helicopter to go get yeah. those goats. Yeah. But the one goat I had a legitimate, if he'd have just stayed put for an hour, I probably could have taken a shot. But yeah. that's okay, but that's what next year's for. So we um so when we were in this trip, I had the Zolio updated because we learned about it. <laughs> <laughs> so talking to the wife and she mentioned she goes, There's a snowstorm coming in. Okay. And this was on um, the afternoon of the, th- the third day that we were been in there. Okay. And she's like, you know, you guys, you're going to get a lot of snow. You, it's up to you. And so my son and I decided to hike out on the fourth day in the okay. morning. Yep. We got up, we got packed. It was already snowing. Every morning we woke up, we were covered. The tent was covered in snow. And so we started hiking out. It took us four and a half hours to get out. Okay. Uh, well, at least get to the road. Right. To get to back, to walk back to the truck. And uh, from there, we got out, we drove home, and um, we, so we drove back to Cranbrook. And we stayed the night. We got into Cranbrook. It was dark. It was like 4.30. Okay. And hit back to the Motel 6. And then there we are. And then the floods happened again. Right. <laughs> so now we're stuck in Cranbrook. So when we're in Cranbrook, let's go whitetail hunting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So we went whitetail hunting, and uh, for the first two days, we were trying to figure out the area, and I never asked anybody where to go. I just basically looked at fat maps and looked at my map, back roads map book and just f- tried to find an area that I thought might hold some deer. Yep. That was not too far from the city either because there was a damn lot of whitetails running around the city. Really? Oh, every, everywhere. Stupid. Like most cities in the... In, uh, in the Okanagan and the Kootenays, there's just whitetails everywhere or, right. or mule deer everywhere. Yeah. But yeah, there was just everywhere. So I was like, I don't want to go too far away from the city. I want to yeah. try and be in crown land that's close to the city, right? And yeah. not too high. I wouldn't want to deal with all the snow again. I, yeah. I needed some no snow, which was great about Cranbrook. It had no snow at that time. And uh, so we tried two days trying to get my kid a whitetail. He wanted a buck. He didn't really want to shoot a doe. Yeah. And uh, we just couldn't get into it, but we were learning the area. And then... um the roads were planning, they were saying the roads were going to open up on the Tuesday, the 30th to let us back through. But my kid had already missed a week of school. Right. And so it was like, okay, well, son, you can, I'm not leaving on the 30th here because I'm not driving home after hunting. So I would leave on the first. So you missed three more days of school or I can fly you home from Cranbrook. We'll fly you back to Langley or to Vancouver. And he didn't want to, he didn't want me to spend the money, but but I was like, no, you gotta go to school. Like, like oh, it's up to you, your decision. And he chose he wants to go back to school. So okay. we, so we flew him back home. So it was just myself and Cranbrook stuck there for two more days. And so um we had always Caleb and I had always tried to get into this one area, this one road. And every time we drove in, there was always a truck ahead of us. And okay. so we just stopped, turned around, and went the other way. And we didn't we're not gonna bother him, right? So the third morning, my first morning by myself, I got up super early. Right, it didn't get. It gets light there at about like eight o'clock. Okay, and so, but I was in there by like six thirty. I was in there early, and then I knew that no way the locals would be in there that early. Yeah. So I get in there, and were you physically seeing the other guy before? Or were you just seeing fresh tracks? No, I, I actually saw his truck. Okay, okay. Yeah, I saw his headlights. Gotcha. Twice, and I backed up. I was like, ugh. I mean, I don't know if it's the same guy, right? But yeah, obviously there's guys going in there early. This might be an area that I want to go look at. Yep. And so the third morning, I get in there, and I went on Fat Maps again to look up the area, search. And was this the, the weekend? You was it the weekend days you were running into him? Uh, no, it was the Saturday Sunday. It was a Saturday Sunday. That's what I mean. It was the yeah. weekend days, so you're running into yes, Saturday Sunday, yes, yeah. and then you went early by yourself on, on the Monday, Monday morning. And I just want to call that out because for us, like lower mainland people who are going up to these places where the locals get to hunt all the time, way more local pressure on the weekends. Yeah. Because they can hunt out their backyard yeah. on the weekend and then they go back to work Monday. So when I'm doing my trip, obviously you, you know, I, 
you were there because you were trying to go goat hunting, but just a little tip for people listening. If you're planning a, a hunt to one of these areas that has a lot of local hunting pressure, try and show up on the Monday mm-hmm. instead of showing up for the weekend because you're oh. going to get less local hunting pressure. Yeah. So, but that's that. I also want to call out the fact that you weren't, you were very conscientious that like it was a small area, one road. If you were going in there, it was either going to invite some kind of conflict. And even if it didn't, it was an inappropriate thing to do. Mm-hmm. Like it's just rude. Yeah. Um, and so I, I really want to call that out because I think that's more people kind of need to pay attention to that. And also, if you really want to get in there, do what you did because mm-hmm. that's what gives you its first, you know what I mean? Nobody owns that road. Yeah. First dude who shows up gets gets dips. Yeah. We're all, we're all public land hunters, right? Yeah, so. totally. I think so, that's great. Yeah. Okay. So it's Monday. We get up at the crack of dawn. Yeah. Now we're in there at 6.30 and we get the place to ourselves. Yeah. So I, I knew there's a trail there too. So we get in there, we go on this trail and um, I, I hike in. And uh, I'm just searching the area. I'm just, I'm looking for a bedding area that, you know, has a transition area and that's going to lead to a food source. Sure. And Caleb and I had found a watering hole that had tracks everywhere and just crap everywhere. It was just, it was very, very well trafficked. And I didn't want to sit on the watering hole either, right? I wanted to sit in between. And so I I was like, well, looking at my fat maps because I've been marking waypoints through the whole two days that we were in there and searching. And so I sat, I found a spot, I sat, and I literally put my back literally against the bedding area, okay. right on the edge. And I'm facing, I'm facing there, and then it, it, it kind of curves over. And what type, because I don't know shit about whitetails, what types of things are you looking for that's letting you know that's a bedding area? Is it a type of vegetation? The thickest, darkest part on the on your uh, fat maps or your or your Google Maps or Gaia, whatever. Okay. Whatever the thickest, darkest part there, that's their bedding area. A okay. lot of times. Okay. And then if if the lower than that, um, on it goes a little bit lighter, and there's some patches of clearing and what have you, right? And it's grass. That that's their transition area. Okay. At least this is what I'm thinking of. I'm sure. N- I'm new to whitetail hunting. And I've only watched a ton of videos and I'm just giving it my best. But this is your strategy. This is my strategy. Yep, I like it. I'm giving it my best and and uh, and I'm and I'm I'm going for it. Right? Okay. So I sit and literally 25 minutes after I sit, a doe walks by me at 10 yards. I'm in the right area because I want the area where they're gonna walk through and then they're gonna go bed. And then she's gonna get up a couple hours later and she's gonna walk by me. And hopefully because they're rotten right now, that white tail is going to be following them. Yep. And so I sit there, and the doe goes back, and f- four hours later, a buck walks out, and it, but it walks out just on the the edge of the curvature of the of of the hill, and all I could see is its rack, right, just on the other side. And so I don't rush a shot, and I was laying in prone. I, I, you know, it, I can see the top of its head in its rack. There's no shot there. And so I get up, I'm like, oh, you know, it's, it's just a little bit too far. I'm just in the wrong spot, but I'm in the right area. No problem. And so I was, I actually put this on uh, the whitetail hunting group. I was like, I, I, I had to go take a piss. <laughs> I had to pee. I've been laying there for like, I don't know how many hours, right? Yeah. I was like, okay, I'm going to pee. I missed the buck. Boom. Another buck. Five right there. I'm on my knees and there's other buck comes at my eight o'clock. And this thing was huge. And I could hear it bouncing in. One bounce, two bounce, three bounces at my 8 o'clock, like 15 yards. And on this hunt, I, my gun, which is right here, is on my right. I grab it, and I go to turn left, and it's gone. Okay. Bing, bing, gone. I see it bouncing. The flag, the flag is waving. Bye-bye. Such a beautiful sight, but terrible sight at the same <laughs> yeah. time, right? And, uh Okay. So I, I hike out of there, but I don't go the same way that I came in. Okay. I go the long way. I go around their bedding area, over these hills and that. And I, I'm breaking some bush, but I'm trying to be quiet. I take extra long time to get out and go to my truck. Because you don't want to drag your scent through the area, like their travel corridor. Yeah, well, that big buck that came at my 8 o'clock literally ran right back through the trail that okay. that I came in on. And so I didn't want to follow him just in case he did stop maybe, you know, a few hundred yards or what have you, right? right a kilometer yep. or two, right? I'm in there uh, 2.7K okay. from the road. So I'm in there a bit, not too far, but I'm in there. 
And so I just, I, it was just my theory. This is my thought process. And yeah. so I just went out and then I, I went back to the hotel because it was dark and I went on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> On the hunting group, on the on the whitetail hunting page, and I messaged the group because it seems to be a little bit positive group. And it said, "This is a scenario that happened. Should I go back there tomorrow? And then what is the best plan of attack?" Yeah. And uh, countless people, everybody said, "Yes, get your butt back in there." Except for one dude. One dude's like, "No, don't go in there." But everybody said, "Go." Ninety nine percent said, "Go back in there," and uh, just post up in a different spot. And um, then they all gave me their feedback on what I should do. Right. Rattle them in, uh, doe call them in. Like they're just uh, spray yourself in doe pee, like just crazy ass things, right? And uh, all could be beneficial and could work, right? My thing, I kind of just get it, sneak in there, sit down, and just be quiet. Sure. And just watch, observe. And so what I did was I went down a hundred yards lower than what I was, and more a little, maybe another like. 50 yards past, but still in that general same cut where I could see that uh, that uh, buck come out of uh, where the hillside, but now I could see him, right? Yeah. And I, I found a fallen tree and I posted up behind the tree. I could lay prone. I could put my rifle on top there, be nice and comfortable and be able to shoot. Now I'm shooting uphill about 140 yards is where I'm thinking they're going to walk out, right? And the does were going to come up on me on the left, go over the ridge, and literally walk right in front of me. And hopefully the bucks would be following them, right? Five hours later, that's what happened. <laughs> that same buck that I saw walk on the curvature, right? He, I saw him earlier again. He came out the exact same spot and instantly turned right. And then he came back and there was the doe came. And then 15 minutes later, he was tracking the doe. On a, on a line too, like he was moving. Right. He wasn't taking his time. They were just, and I just I followed him for forty yards from my left, up, up, up. Waited, just waited until he was getting in front of me. I had my rifle ready. I had both eyes open so I could keep watching him. Then I would check my eye, check radical good, and boom. And I, the the seven mm wisdom just dropped him right then and there. He didn't move. But I couldn't see, couldn't see him because he's down in the curvature in the yep. the incline. So I sat there, and my heart is racing, just I, that adrenaline rush and that just pure emotion is just like, oh my god, I don't know, did I get him? What, what I don't know. The doe ran at me after the bang, and she was like fifty yards in front of me, and I was like, no, that's the doe. Okay, that's a good thing. So I started walking up, and I'm trying to bino. And I'm trying to buy no, and I'm shaking so bad. I'm shaking so bad, buddy. And I can't see. So I go, okay, calm down. I take some deep breaths. I'm calm, calm. A bino, and I see a patch of white. There it is. A patch of white. And I'm like, there's no snow. There's no <laughs> snow around here. There's no snow. And I run off like 15 yards. I didn't run to it because I'm still, I'm like probably 100, 100, 110 yards away still. Okay. But I see a white patch and then I bino again and I see the rack. I instantly just, I called my wife. I FaceTimed her because yeah. I was in cell service and I broke down. I was just like, I did it, honey. I did it. Like I, it was such a joyous moment an emotional moment but it was just a relief too that all the hard work that i did because this journey started in may um rehabilitating myself and my back it paid off yeah right like and it was just it was just like oh. and then when i walked up to it and i wanted to i just wanted to be so respectful and just and just and i filmed that moment uh, and my reaction and just checking it out. And I was blown away. It was way more than I could have asked for. Right. Not just for like, it, cause it was a nice looking buck. It was, you know, it, it didn't suffer. It dropped there and right then there, it right in his tracks. And then it, the, I've always wanted a bread basket yeah. for my white tail wrap around with the tips almost touching and that. Yeah. And just like almost symmetrical, perfect. 
and I I got that in a in my seven by six white tail. Yeah, that it was. I was just blown away. I was just like, oh. And so you know, I I texted my one of my good hunting buddies. Yep. And then I I FaceTime my son. Okay. At two o'clock in the afternoon. I totally forgot about the time change because in right. Cranbrook I'm in Mountain Time. Yep. Not it didn't even clue in. I FaceTimed him at two o'clock, and he knew that Dad got a buck. Yeah. So he answered it in class. He brings his buddies over, and they're all behind him, and his face. I got a fucking buck! I got a fucking buddy buck at this thing, and I'm screaming. And his teachers, what's going on? What's going on? My dad just got a buck. My dad just got a cranker. And so that, that that was just such a good moment. I mean, I wish my kid was there with me because he, you know, he worked hard and he wants to yeah. experience that. But that moment was pure too. It was, it was beautiful. That's awesome, man. Yeah. But then it started getting dark real quickly. Yeah, we got to get this deer out. <laughs> yes, and so I th- put on the headlamp, uh, the, the headlamp, and just started going at it. And I'd never done it before myself. Yep. And um, on that trip, I was carrying my uh, I my I wear a thirty six hundred pack. Okay. Um, as my day pack, and it, it fits me like a spider monkey. I love that pack actually, and I can carry a decent amount of weight in it. And so I. Uh, I heard a trick about putting down the emergency blankets, and then when you cut the meat out, you put the meat on the emergency blankets, keep it all clean. Yep. And so that's the first thing I did. I took out the emergency blanket, and then as, as I skinned my skinned my deer out and I was taking off the quarters, I just put them right on the emergency blanket, kept it all nice and clean. Yep. And then um, and then put them into game bags after that, and then threw it in my pack. And the first pack out, I I took the the back straps. I got them out both nice and nice and good. And then um, I took the tenderloins, and then um, I took the the head and the cape, okay, and I walked that out, and that was a good pack. And that that was, I I pushed myself walking out on that one because it was getting dark. Um, I was by myself; it was the first time going, and but my phone was dying. Okay, my phone was dying, and and so I knew the general way and, and the road, but the road. And the trail in, it gets real like treed, right? right. You, you know, you, you said your, your buddy that like, you, you lose the you lose the trail very easily sometimes, yep. especially in the dark. And so I I got out there and I got to the truck and you know once you get to that truck and you take that pack off and it's just like oh, just exhale. Yeah, I did it. I went back to the motel and had a couple of drinks for sure. Definitely <laughs> calling every one of my yeah. buddies and texting them pictures. And then uh, the next morning, got up and right back in there at 9 a.m. and hike in, nice and fresh and empty pack. But everything was there. Nothing got touched. It was beautiful. Not, yeah. It was all, it was great. Put in the bags and put in my pack and then let's go. Yep. Got the rest out. So what are you going to, are you going to mount it? I have the option. So um, my buddy, Ken Pamplin, owns um a black powder tannery and, oh okay yeah and so um he's also the the guy the ex guy that i'm telling you about right? yeah, yeah. The shockey and so um he said uh you know if he wants me mounted i coach his son in hockey that uh he'll mount it for me um so i scalped it out yep um i watched a youtube video on how to do it started it in the front the lips and that and just worked my way back to about halfway and then flipped it around did the other side and yep and uh, so right now I have it uh, wrapped up, salted. Yep. Uh, I got most of the meat off the cape, not all of it, but I got most of it off. I salted it, wrapped it up, and then it's in my freezer. Yeah, for sure. It's in the deep freeze. It's great. Yeah, Ken said, he goes, don't leave it more than a year. Yeah. He goes, but if, you know, we can always get you another white tail cape. Right. right. Or you could shoot another white tail and just use that one, right? Right. So I don't know sure if I'm going to. I've talked to the wife about it, but... You know, the Euro mount looks great too. I've always been a Euro mount. I'm guy. a big fan of Euros, I'm gonna be honest. I did get yeah. my my Arizona buck mounted and it, it's a really nice white tail. Like if you work, it's definitely a mountable buck. You know what I'm saying? Like um it, it would be worth it. But I'm not I'm not head over heels. Like I'm not super into mounts, I'm gonna be honest. Yeah. Like I'm not some people like just love them and they do them with every single deer. I think I'm kind of more into Euros and yeah, and we too. live in Vancouver. We have a nice house, but it's like I don't have endless room for, you know, shoulder mounts. And I can fit a lot more stuff with Euros as well. Absolutely. And I think they're a little, I don't want to say tasteful. Like my wife's a vegetarian. She supports my hunting. 
but uh, she does find the mounts a little weird. But the euros, she's way more comfortable with because it's like just a skull. Yeah, well, they're actually, you know, they, and they have like decorators. They use those like euros and that, yes. right? They use the fake ones and that. And, and it was, it does, it has a kind of an, a good look to it, right? Yeah. What I was debating on is like I haven't bleached it yet. Yeah. I've just boiled the skull. Okay. And um, I actually I did it on my barbecue because I didn't have my propane heater with yeah. me, so I did it on the barbecue, and um, so I just boiled it, cleaned it off. Uh, it was pretty good. Like most of the cartilage is still in the fine stuff is still there. So yep. I did it that way. All right. But I haven't um, bleached it or Clorox it or some people you or painted it. Right? right. I've seen some guys paint it like off white and that if they want it, they're really white. And so I haven't decided how I'm going to finish it Okay. right now. So right now it's just on my dresser. And um, when I get back, when we get back, then I'll, I'll figure out what I'm going to do with it and then finish it off there. I think I used borax. Yeah. Um, and then you use that hairdresser um, cream peroxide, the yep. 40% stuff. You got to get it at like a beauty salon. And then for sealing, what I've heard is mop and glow to keep it that nice kind of off-white color. Yeah. So you just bleach it and then you just get mop and glow and you paint it on there and it yeah. like seals the skull up. But I've never done that. All the euros I've done, I just bleached them. And I don't. I kind of like that they get that kind of aged Look to yeah, them. I like that too. Right now, they aged the off color. Yeah, and, and the, you can see the lines. Right, I like that a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. The only thing is that um, the the nasal part is splitting. You know how it has those two the cracks in that. Yeah, it's splitting down the middle. So I think I'm gonna like gorilla glue that back. Make sure I keep it there. I don't want it to keep separating. I think right. I could see it over time separating in that. Right. right. Especially when the dogs gets it or something like that. So no, I glue all that together. Make sure to keep it nice. So we'll figure it out. Badass man. Okay, so we get we get the white tail, and then we go back home. And is is this the next? Yes. Yeah. So um, been home. I was home for eight days. Okay. And then I got the white tail bow hunt. So I booked this hunt off of uh, Book Your Hunt. Okay. And I booked and I booked this back in August. Okay. I wanted something to look forward to. And I figured that, you know, this might be given a good opportunity just as a last chance if I didn't get anything this yep. year, right? But even if I didn't get anything, as we talked about before, it was okay as long as I had some good experiences. I learned and I had some adventures. And this year I've pushed myself farther than I ever And you've have. been a pr predominantly a rifle hunter up till this point and we're on a bow hunt, right? Yeah, this is my first bow hunt. Okay, so that's, that's another uh, awesome opportunity to push yourself. Yes, yeah. Th so... I originally got into bow hunting. Uh, well, I originally got started shooting a bow to relax. Right. As a, like just release it, to shoot it in my backyard. Okay. I, have a, I live in Langley, so I have a decent sized backyard. Yep. I got like 35 yards that I can shoot across. I'm jealous. And I so, thought I was going to be able to sight in my bow in my backyard. I live right in East Vancouver. I've got 12 yards. Oh, like I swear, like that, yeah. that's it, man. I was like, shit. Yeah. I'm like, this is not going to work. I could work with 20. Yeah. At least I can get my 20 pin. Yeah. The rest I can then figure out. out. But I was like, no, I got to, I had to go, I got to go to the archery range. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a challenge. Yeah. That's a challenge for sure. Buddy. Yeah. Well, and when we bought our place, my only problem with the place was that it's a 25 foot lot, not a 33 foot lot. And we're long and skinny, obviously not that long and skinny. If it's only 12 yards in the back. But when we were looking at houses, I wanted a house that had a wide enough lot that I could shoot beside the house. Because I figured in yeah, East yeah, Vancouver, yeah. that would be the only way that I would yeah. be able to put together like a 30, 40 yard yeah. shot. And unfortunately, this house ticked every single other box. More importantly, the wife liked it. Uh, but it didn't, it's too skinny on the sides yeah. to shoot. My do neighbors have, freak out. Do you guys have those alleyway homes there? We don't on ours, no. no. Not on yours? We... The way ours, we don't even have an alleyway. We write, we're kind of one house in from the corner. And so when you go around the corner, actually it's the second guy around the next corner. The side of his house is kind of my backyard. Oh, okay. Or like ends my backyard. Yeah. Um, so, which is kind of nice because we get more privacy because it's like a big fourplex building. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, no, uh, no laneway house for us. Yeah. So no. Uh, yeah, so this is our first, my first bow hunt up here, and uh, and they've been great. They've, it's been awesome. Yeah, it's good experience. Beautiful area. This is the first time I've been here, and they're set up like these cabins are sick. Yeah, like they're beautiful, man. Like, 
And they're just what you need and just what you want. Yeah. I don't want anything more than this. No. They get they each got their own little bathroom. They've got their own little electric heater. They're brand new. I don't like I guess that's probably pine, whatever the fuck we're looking at. But everything is super clean. The cook has been great. Oh, awesome. Two yeah. old guides, Larry yeah, and Elrich. Um, one's 70, the other's 74. Yeah. That's crazy. He has to go home every night and take care of his mom. Larry? Yeah. His that's, mom? That's why he, yeah, he's 92. Holy yeah. shit. 92 and happy. <laughs> he's like, Wild. Oh. He's like, I gotta get home. I gotta take care of mom. I'm like, geez, buddy, you got a long day. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Okay, so you were here before me and you've got kind of three days in under your belt. So just what's the hunt? Describe the hunt here for me. Uh, so meet at the kitchen, a uh, little lodge area, 6 a.m. Yep. Um, figure out where the guides will let you know where you're going to go. Um, they'll drop you off. Uh, everything is uh, tree stands, yep. tree stand hunting here. They probably have... I would say about fifteen to twenty different tree stand locations in this in this territory of theirs. Yep, in this general area of white for white tails, and so it was my first time hunting from a tree stand. And I've been in uh, four different ones over the three days. Okay, and um, they're all different. And just and it's a bit of a morning hunt, evening hunt setup, right? Yeah. So the, well, you if you like that's just how they normally run it but if you yeah. wanted to do an all day sit they would prepare a lunch for you and snacks for you and then you can go do an all day sit gotcha gotcha but um i the first day i was here it was uh minus 10 yeah and that was a cold sit yeah so i was like can you come pick me up <laughs> <laughs> so they picked me up at um uh 11 okay on that morning and then we had breakfast uh at 11:30 when i got back and so I sat from, I got dropped off at like seven o'clock. So seven to 11. And uh, that's a good sit in that weather, man. Yeah, it was. And you can't move at all. It's not like you can, even when you're glassing in that weather, like you get up, you walk around the hill, you could do some push ups. Yeah. Like when you're in a tree stand, man, you ain't doing shit. No, you're sitting and the first trick that I learned that I've, I've heard this before, but I didn't remember right at the start was, if you if if your your floor has is graded or whatever, cover it. Right. Because the wind comes off. Oh, yeah. and it goes right through your boots. Yeah. And I have good boots and, and Arctics and that and they were and but they went right through. I was like, oh, that first little half. I was like, oh Jesus, I'm getting cold here, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Put that down. And I was like, oh, that's better. Yeah, that's Absolutely. a good tip for sure. Yeah. I've been hiking up my little buddy heater though in each in each tree stand. <laughs> And just flipping her on. <laughs> I'm staying warm. <laughs> just just take the edge off. Just sure. take the and it's so quiet, right? Yeah, it doesn't make any noise at all. It's it's great. The only noise it makes is if the wind comes and it gets that little crackle noise, right? right. But but other than that is it's fine. And if the wind's there anyways, the deer are not hearing it. So yeah. And so yeah, so every day I've seen um except for today, but the first day I saw a spiker. Yep. Spiker came in and a couple of does came in. And, uh, you know, it was just a really young one, too. Like, it was just, yeah, no, okay, well, the deer here, at least, you know, we're in the right spot. Yeah. And then the second, um, not much in the afternoon. The afternoon was a little bit quieter. Uh, that first hunt, though, when we were driving in on the, they were driving in me in the side by, uh, Mama Cougar track. Ooh. And two, and the two kids, two kittens. Wow. Uh, so mama and one kitten are walking down one tire track lane, like fresh powder because it was been snowing every night. And the other one there, and uh, Larry, our guy's like, yeah, she's teaching them to hunt. And, they, and so, and then we're getting up and we're following them for like a couple K. And I'm like, oh God, please don't be going right to the tree stand. Please don't. And then they went straight and we turned right at the end. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, that's good. That's badass. Yeah. And the second day, um, I saw... In the morning, sit. I went to. I went across the road, across the valley, and I sat and um, just saw does. I had does in all day. Uh, lots of lots of uh, mama fawns and two fawns. Tons of those coming in. And but that evening sit, the afternoon sit. That was a good sit yesterday afternoon. Uh, so I went to this uh, other stand that was a little bit lower, and eight eight does. I had eight does just running around for literally an hour and 15 minutes, 15 yards in front of me, 20 yards in front of me. 
they're just everywhere. And I'm just, I was standing because when I saw them come in, right? And because I was in that tight box, I, I couldn't draw in there. So I was like, okay, if I stand up, I can draw. Yeah. And so I stood for two hours. I was like, standing there. It was like, because first hour and 15 minutes, there was like eight of them. And then the one mama doe was, she was mean actually. She would jump uh, and jump on top of them and hoof them, kick really? them off the food pile. Like, this is my food pile and my fawn's food pile. Like, Walk off. That's hilarious. <laughs> Just watch them do that. But it's cool to watch them interact like that. Yeah, yeah. And then, but then those four were, there was four left over. They were there for another 45 minutes. I was just standing there for two hours. I was getting a little tired, but they leave. And then the buck comes in. Okay. And I see him on a rope again. And yep. he's just beelining it right down to the four does. And, um, Are you hearing them come in at all in the snow? I was wondering that today. I'm hearing a bit for yeah. sure uh, because I'm hearing they're definitely cracking more more twigs. Okay, because they can't see them underneath, especially right. if they're jumping up and landing on them and yep. that. So I'm definitely hearing that. I've been hearing a lot of grunts from bucks as well. Like okay. I, I, every day I'm hearing grunts. That's my only regret is I wish I brought some shit to call. Yeah, yeah. That's I feel like uh, that was a bit of a, a miss. Um, well, I have um, a, 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 a doe can and a buck call if you want. I'll leave yeah. it here for you, and you can borrow that and use that up. Um, right. I didn't use it a lot only because I'm not completely familiar on how to use it perfectly. I got to admit, I'm not either. Yeah. I've had good success calling blacktails yeah. in the past, which you just kind of do with like a doe can, and it would have been nice. I think they've got some shed antlers. I might ask one of the guys tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Because it would be nice to, yeah. to, uh, to rattle. Mm -hmm. um as well because i don't really know what i'm doing with the grunt tube for example mm -hmm. so like i'm not going to just go make random noises if i don't know what i'm doing but that's good to know they're still grunting um yeah. and there does seem to be rut activity still going on yeah actually they were showing um uh elrich was showing me some of the trail cam photos which yeah. is nice if you want to see them they'll show you them all yeah and um there was actually a couple of the trail cam photos where they're they're actually clashing against each other Right. And that, so I was like, oh, okay, well, you know, that's good then. Yeah. So um, what's this buck look like who comes in on a rope? <laughs> the four by two. Yeah. So they had thought that um, it maybe had uh, broken off uh, a side. Oh, okay. But it's not. It's uh, it's just some weird ass growth. Okay. Like it's just a deformity. Uh, the right side is perfect. It's it's a it's a nice, decent four point, uh, decent tines. I'd probably say maybe like, couple seven seven inch tines or so they're not bad they're not great but they're it's you know it's decent this sure. area there's not a huge box for it not yeah. a ton there can be some big ones but there's not a ton right yeah. the coots there's there's bigger bucks over there right. right and so he comes in and he's at the pile and i'm i'm standing still because i've been standing and I get on him and I'm debating him. And I instantly think I'm going to pass him right now because it's day two. Yep. And there's a five by five walking around here that they have pictures of. Okay. There's another four by four and there's a decent three by three. Okay. Um, and I still have all day today to hunt. And, yeah. and I still had a little bit of time last night. Right. And so I first. So you're just over halfway through your hunt. Yeah. At this point. Correct. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to pass him. But then he starts walking away. I, I, okay, I'm going to get full draw. I get full draw. Okay, okay. Nope, nope. I even stopped him too. I just gave a little grunt. I yeah. stopped him and he turned back and looked over his left his left shoulder, which is two. And it wasn't broken off. It was just a deformity, as he said. And so I was like, no. And he was there. He's only like 20 yards. So it's it's, it's pretty hard to miss at that point. Dude. <laughs> and so, I, I, I but I left him. Yep, and I was like, but if I saw him today, I was going to shoot him today. Yeah, I, you know, just I, 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 you know, it would have been a story, right? Sure. And not that um, I didn't like uh, that. It has to be a perfect four by four or anything like that. Yeah. But it was just it was like the middle of my hunt. Yeah. Right. And and that was just not the deer that I wanted to finish off my hunting season with. Because sure. if I shot, if I pulled that and I got him, hunting season's over. There's no day today. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, I kind of wanted to have another sit. Sure. And so, you know, today, and so today out there, and today was a little bit quieter for sure. And then I, as the does, when the does were coming in down the hill, they, they busted me. I, I slipped. And so that, it, that's hunting. Yeah, it happens. Learn. Yeah. That's all right, though. It's been a great year. 
Yeah, man. Yeah. It's That's been a, it's a fantastic year. It's been a great year. And it, just as we were talking about it, now I'm going to start planning in January and yeah. let the wife know uh, what my thoughts are. And and so I've already got some pretty good ideas. of. What so what's the do. goal for next year? And I don't mean like an animal or something, but I like how you're like approaching this from like a, you know, a learning perspective. So if you had to set out like one thing you want to accomplish next year, what, what would it be? Um, like an unsupported hunt for a week. Okay. Uh, I think that's probably a really good goal to yep. start. I like uh, it. Um, because I have to be physically fit still. Yeah. And at 45 years old, I'm glad that hunting is my motivation to, to get in better shape and to get healthier. Yep. That's only going to make my life better. But uh, an unsupported hunt for seven days in the back country. I think it takes good. a little bit more in the logistics and the planning end too. Yeah. Got to be a little more dialed in with your food, yep. a little more dialed in with your mapping, a little bit less yeah. slack. Like, yeah. yeah, that's, I like it. Yeah. That, and then for animals is an elk. Yeah. That's the priority for next year. That That is, I am taking all of September off to hunt elk. Yeah. So I'll give myself a good opportunity. And then, but that's going to entail um, scouting as well. Yeah. That was a buddy I just spent some time with on the phone. He was like, that's everything, man. He goes, if you can do anything to up your elk game next year, it's get out in the summer. And it's tough because, I, you know, I only get so much time away from home and I want to be hunting all that time. But I'm realizing maybe I got to sacrifice a little bit of that time to get some scouting and to increase my odds, especially yeah. for certain animals like elk and stuff. Summertime, you could take your daughter for a camping trip. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, and then look for elk. Might even pick up like a little trailer or something. We've got a big-ass, big Agnes tent that she loves being in, so that's great. We could take that too, but my wife's not into it, but we get a little travel trailer, take the kid away. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to try and get some scouting in. And like we were talking earlier, my old man is coming up yeah. in September. So I got to do some elk. I got to sort out. Oh, you know what? I'm going to cut that out because he might hear this before Christmas. <laughs> he probably doesn't listen to this. That's all right, though. The other the other thing that I wanted, that I have on my mind is, uh, from being here is building my own tree stand. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Especially in that, uh, where I got that white tail. Yeah. Uh, building a, a tree stand. Now, would there. you do tree stands or would you do the saddle thing? Uh, well, I've I've seen the saddles, uh, like only a little bit. So I, I don't know all about them. Yeah. Right. But I, but I have looked into them a bit. I've looked into everything. I would build something big where I was comfortable and then yeah. ma- that I could, that I could. Can you legally stuff. though on crown land? Like they can only build these here because they have tenure. I don't know. I don't think you can. But they are out there. Yeah, fair. Fair. <laughs> Better to ask for forgiveness. We, we just won't do a I podcast. Didn't do it. What are you not going to yeah. We Saw won't do here. a podcast telling them where you illegally built the stand. Yeah. Um, but that, I have thought that. I've thought about, you know, because having something like developing an area or finding an area that maybe consistently has deer or has elk. I'm kind of playing around with the idea of a wreck yeah. property. Yeah. Like just a piece of shit piece of land. You know what I mean? Like 10, 20, 30 acres that has nothing on it. Because I've always kind of written off whitetail hunting and stand hunting because I have this like ethnocentric perspective from like Western hunting that if you're not like hiking in mountains, you're a pussy. And there's so much like strategy and planning that goes into working a whitetail property. Mm, And it's like- and, and you can't really get into that on crown land because there's so many factors yeah. out of your control. I think the guys who are really good on crown land who can kind of do the run and gun tree stand with like the really light tree stands or the saddles. Yeah, yeah. I got a lot of respect for those guys. I think that's super hard. And I'm a couple of years away from it, but I would love to be able to have a piece of property where I could like do a couple food plots and like put a couple stands in different places and then look for their bedding area and transitions and travel corridors and like just figure that puzzle out. That's Mm. super attractive to me. Oh, hundred percent. I've actually been um, putting it in my wife's ear for the last uh, year. I want to move up North or move to the Coots um, and get a few hundred acres. Yep. I've been doing coaching hockey development full time for 13 years now. And it's just, I love it. I, I'm I'm good at it. Passionate about it. But I just at my age too, I'm kind of wanting a change. Sure. And 
and to, and just looking at the regulations and just and hearing things and hearing old timers and hearing guys talk about the government and talking about what may happen to hunting and where hunting may go right may have to have a guy may have to you know there's just so much crap that we hear just taking care of it and having my own land yeah right and, and you know i could bring my buddies up and then now with some of the regulations i, I could even lease it out and, uh, to hunting opportunities right yeah. like there's just lots of things that you could come with that and and that's securing that for myself and my buddies would be or even buying it with like you know like get like three buddies and buy it right like you'd you can just buy timber land too, yeah, and then just timber that, and like that pays for the property. Like just so many opportunities there. Yeah, for sure. But I would have to have elk on it. That's the one thing. <laughs> if I was going to buy a property, I would want a property that had elk on, or jet, that has an opportunity to have yeah, an elk on it, for sure. Right? Because then we can take care of that elk thing. Yeah, that's the big. That's the big challenge, man. Okay, so to wrap this up a little bit, so I'm here for two more days. I'm the. There's another hunter in camp, Ivan. You and Ivan are both headed out tomorrow morning, and I'm it. Yeah. I'm, I'm the last hunter in camp, and I'm the last hunter in the season. So I've got two days left. I hunted two sits today, a morning sit, which I got in a little bit late for because of some driving complications that we won't get into. And then I had an evening sit, and I didn't see shit. I didn't see a single living animal on either sits. So I got my fingers crossed, and I got I got two more full days and I'm not being terribly picky. If I see your four by two, yeah. he's getting stuck. Yeah, no, you should absolutely. And and they'll take you to the to where I was for the last day and a half. Yeah. And I, you're gonna just what we talked about. You yeah. will see deer. I, I, you're gonna see deer. Just get in there and be quiet. Sit down low. Yeah. And and then then hopefully if those does are in there for like 30, 40 minutes, then hopefully that buck comes out right because yeah. he's waiting until at least this is what I think that he knows that it's, it's safe. Those right. does are fine. Okay. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to eat too now. Yeah. And then if you do, you should hammer them. Yeah, I'm gonna. Absolutely. Yeah. Or if the four by four comes, you know, or the five by five, you know, I, I hope that you have some luck and get into some action. Yeah, me too. Um, all right. Well, that's it folks. As always, um, engage with the platform, like, comment, share, subscribe. It's greatly appreciated. Oh, and I always forget to mention this, or I have in the last few. If you want to directly support the podcast, uh, go buy a t-shirt or a hat, uh, mindfulhunter.com slash shop and buy some shit. It helps pay for everything that I do on the podcast, gear reviews. Um, I buy lots of gear and end up selling it to try and pay for, for some of the reviews and shit. So anyways, it all helps, and uh, thanks for tuning in. And I was glad we got a chance to do this, Bob. That was good. That was awesome. And congratulations on your whitetail, man. Thank you, buddy. It was actually it's nice to put a see you in person and put yeah. a face to everybody and get to know each other a little bit and sit around the fire. Yeah, and unlike Matt Ranella espouses, social media is not all bad. No, it's not all bad at all. Yeah, There's, there there can be a lot of good things. Like just as you and Agostino were talking about the other day, a lot of good things can come out of it yeah, too. I think so too. For sure. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.